Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the April edition of the Agricultural Markets Situation and Outlook webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, we, we've got, a, again, a full slate of discussion and, and, uh, and, and presentations. Um, Dr. Parman does have some conflicts later on uh, during this session, so he will let him go first. Uh, and we will pause for just a little bit to see if you have any questions specifically for Brian. Um, and then if we can save the rest of the Q&A to the very end, that would probably work the easiest and best for everybody. So again, we'll, we'll do our best to try and answer the questions as they come up. Um, and with that, I will stop sharing and I will let Dr. Parman take over. All right, so today I have uh, uh, two parts to a presentation. First, I'm gonna talk about uh, the latest and greatest inflation numbers that just came out. Um, that's kind of forefront on everyone's mind and what's going on in the macro economy. And then uh, our recent publication came out uh, yesterday on cropland values across the state. I know there's a lot of interest in uh, what those are uh, based on the trust land surveys. So I'm gonna cover that real quick. And then again, uh, I have to get off. I have some uh, uh, other obligations I gotta deal with um, here uh, soon, shortly after this. So uh, I'll take your questions right after I'm done presenting and then uh, I'll have to leave. So. Let's go ahead and get started. So here are the, <clears throat> the latest and greatest inflation numbers that came out uh, very recently. And uh, inflation was up again. It was 7.9% for the year that would have ended February 2022. Uh, year ending March 2022, it's increased to 8.5% for all items. Uh, all items, less food and energy, slightly lower than that. That's what they call core inflation, but energy, energy prices remain high. Uh, and food prices have actually ticked up inflation on that food and shelter items uh, uh, have increased driving that inflation number up uh, that came out um, uh, today eight and a half percent was the was the total. So I so this chart uh, I use uh, is from the Federal Reserve it's the yearly inflation rate um, and so. 2021 some of those numbers still haven't been finalized yet and obviously 2022 is the year we're in. But I just put a line and a dot to show where eight and a half percent inflation is on a historical time scale. And you can see you got to go back to about 1981 uh, to, to, to see inflation anywhere close to eight and a half percent. It's not the highest on record, eight and a half. Uh, that would have uh, occurred just very beginning of 1981 or so, approaching about 13 percent. But it, it is very high. Um, on a historical time scale. I mean, there's only a few years where it was where it was actually higher. And I, uh, the BLS uh, presents these uh, the last 10 years, the monthly inflation rate. And so this is not annualized. This is actually how much imp uh, prices increased or decreased in the last month. And the highlighted ones that I show uh, for last year, 2021. So if you look at this row 2021, you'll see these were the highest uh, in, in or as high or higher than any other month in the last 10 years that are highlighted in yellow. Well, 2022 is the bottom row and I have them bolded. And one of the things you'll notice 2021's inflation rate. So this is for calendar year 2021, not the year ending March or anything like that uh, was 7%. And so it's increased since then. And if you look at 2022, each month, the inflation rate is actually double what it was starting out last year, calendar year 2021. So six tenths of a percent in January as opposed to three. Oops, skipped myself ahead. Eight tenths of a percent as opposed to four tenths in February. And then 1.2% in March, which is the highest of any month uh, in this whole entire pretty much table. Uh, and that's double what it was in March of 2021 when it was six tenths of a percent. So if that continues, we're kind of effectively looking at the potential for uh, if, if, if it stays on this trajectory, double the inflation rate of 7% we saw in 2021. So that remains to be seen. Three, three months is not a, uh, enough really to say where things are gonna shake out this year, but it is starting out uh, much higher than uh, the 2022, starting out much higher than 2021 did, uh, essentially double. So that's, prompting uh, the, the Fed to probably act um, and act more aggressively as these numbers come in. Uh, and, and I show this chart. So the top chart shows the 
likelihood that the Federal Reserve will choose these two effective interest uh, federal funds rate. And before these num this eight and a half percent number came out, so a few weeks ago, it was about 31% thought that they'd only increase it a quarter of a point. And uh, about almost 70% said, you know, between uh, a, a pretty much a half a point increase. Well, after this number came out, it changed. It went from now 91% uh, are saying that that half a point in, uh, increase is going to occur uh, next month. And the longer range forecasts haven't changed that much, but um, it's looking like uh, folks are starting, the markets are starting to bake in uh, these these higher rate, more f potentially more frequent and larger jumps in uh, interest rates come in the coming months and quarters. So that's one of the reasons you'll see these job numbers. You'll see job numbers come out and they're and they're pretty decent or pretty strong, and the market drops. Well, why does that happen? Because of, they're saying that well, if the job numbers are strong and inflation staying high. Then that's going to pro that's going to uh, encourage the Fed to act even more aggressively than they would have in the past and hiking interest rates faster. So that's that's what you're seeing there. But one thing to keep in mind: any action that the Federal Reserve takes in the next few months or so is unlikely to be felt uh, for for quite a long time. And uh, inflation has momentum. That's one of the things about it is that inflation tends to have momentum. And in order to halt that momentum. Uh, a lot of these rate hikes are going to have to happen and maybe have to happen more aggressively and more frequently in order to halt it. It just it, it they're kind of in a wait and see on how uh, how long this persists. So I want to shift gears now. I'm going to go ahead and shift to land values. And so the Minneapolis Federal Reserve uh, came out with an article where they discussed uh, land values across our district, which uh, Federal Reserve uh, Minneapolis is our Federal Reserve district. And across the, the district, they had projected that cropland values, non-irrigated, increased by about 22%, and cash rents for non-irrigated cropland increased by about 12% across the district. So that was a district-wide thing. That'd be Minnesota, North Dakota, uh, Montana, um, South Dakota, uh, mainly, um, that those, those states. And then a survey came out earlier this year from the North Dakota uh, American Society of Farm Managers and Rural Appraisers chapter saying that cropland in North Dakota had wrote, risen uh, 28%. And of course, the Red River Valley was the most uh, uh, pricey, uh, approaching about almost 5,500 bucks. Then, then you have the Southeast and the, and the Northeast, uh, North Central. So, Statewide, in, in their es, uh, uh, estimate, uh, cropland prices increased 28% for 2022, heading into 2022. This chart um, com is what we, the, the article that was just put out using the trust lands data. And what we do at North Dakota State is we put um, all these counties, the county level stuff, into our budget districts our ndsu extension budget districts so those are the districts that you see there and then those values going back from 2016 to 2022 and one of the things that we do that's a bit different than you may see in other surveys is we weight the the prices so for instance if you have a parcel of land let's say that's 40 acres and it sells for nine thousand dollars an acre and then you've got five sections or you know a, let's say one section an entire field that sells for uh, uh say thirty five hundred dollars an acre some people would just take that that 40 acres and then that and then that section or whatever quarter and uh and then just take the average of the two so it would be divided by two well what we do is we weight it by the number of acres in other words so if a much larger field sells for less than a much smaller field, that much larger field is going to have a lot more weight in impacting the average than the smaller field does because it's just not very many acres. So uh, that's one of the reasons that we wind up coming up with a lot of times different uh, averages than, than other surveys is because we actually weight it by the number of acres sold. Okay, so so that's, that's one part of it. And then the other part is uh, some of the data sources. But we found statewide about a uh, an 11 percent increase in land values uh, statewide which was lower than the district and uh, significantly lower than the asfmra 
uh, estimate of, of, of nearly 28%. But there were, and I have a chart here at the end that shows each region's increase or, or movement in percentage-wise. And there were some districts that were much higher than this 11% uh, and some a bit lower. But pretty much across the board, uh, significant jumps in land prices uh, across with the most expensive farmland being uh, the Red River Valley at $4,500 an acre, followed by the Southeast uh, $3,400, and then the, the North Valley at, 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 at $3,400 as well. So that's this is kind of how it looks. And you can go on and, and find the article. Uh, it, was, it was released in a news release if you want to read more analysis about it. And then, and I kind of uh, suspected that this would be the case, uh, rents were up uh, across the state, but a lot more modestly, 3.1% as opposed to that nearly 11% increase that uh, uh, land values actually took, cropland values. Uh, in fact, there were some areas that we found a, even a, a tiny decrease percentage-wise. For instance, the Northwest uh, went down from about $35 an acre to $34.60. That could be a little bit of data noise. I don't think that necessarily they actually came down, but what we can probably say from that is they, they really didn't move. And then the same true here in the East Central, uh, pretty much the exact same value it's been uh, rental rate wise, the, the same amount that it's been for the last several years. So probably we're, we saw some movement there in the South Valley, um, but uh, otherwise uh, other areas may, and then maybe there in the Northeast, but not a lot of movement rents wise. And this is that chart I was talking about that uh, I said I would show at the end, showing the rental rate for each uh, NDSU extension uh, budgetary region, and then the land value, and then the percent change of rent versus value. And like I said, cash rents, I mean, the highest movement that we found, and, and again, some of that could be noise, was nothing exceeded a rental increase of 5%, everything 4.99 is the highest and two regions achieved that, one at 4.94, several, at, uh, let's see, almost two or three, two just over 3%, one at 2.85, and then we'll call the Northwest almost no change down slightly, and then the East Central virtually no change, uh, almost zero. And then the values wise, a uh, few areas around that 11, 12% mark, uh, the southeast made a significant jump at uh, 22 percent, but then the other areas, six and a half, five uh, percent there for the south central and the south valley at 6.7 percent. So a lot more modest gains uh, in in rental rates as opposed to land values. Uh, and you see that there. And this one of the things that's significant is, you know, this is the first um, double digit increase that North Dakota has seen in land values in 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 you know since you, you have to go back to like 2014 2013 to have seen uh increases anywhere near that high in land values with respect to rents we don't actually have to go back that far just back to three or four years to have seen a rental change of 3.1 percent in fact you know they've been kind of up three percent maybe down a few percent and that some of that could be data noise but what that tells me for the most part is rents have been holding steady and at least so far appear to be maybe inching upward, but, but very similar to, to what we saw last year. Values on the other hand, uh, in, in, you know, that's, that's, you get to a, an increase of 11, 12%, like we saw it, you know, just over 10%, almost 11. It's a, you're gonna have a hard time saying that that was noise or anything else. There's definitely an increase uh, uh, that, that's occurred, um, whether it's, as high as the ASFMRA survey said at, at 28% or closer to the 11% that we thought um, based on these surveys, it's hard to say, but I will say, as I mentioned before, these are weighted. And so uh, the weighting factor can have, have a, a significant impact on the actual overall increase because it's uh, the number of acres are accounted for uh, when we do our calculations. So again, in, in summary on that, uh, land values across the state are up in every single district, uh, up significantly, uh, almost 11% for the statewide average, uh, and rents up slightly uh, more modestly at that 3.1% mark, and it's not something we haven't seen uh, before in the surveys within the last three or four years uh, coming up that much. And just some comments on it, I, I'm not actually surprised 
because when it comes to land values, you know, that's an investment. That's a, a long range, long, or should be at least a long term planning kind of a decision where a, 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 a maybe it was paid, you know, somebody overpaid or they, they feel like they overpaid or based on the amount of uh, revenue it's generating uh, doesn't quite make financial sense, but you get the advantage of uh, equity buildup, um, the potential for big capital gains in the future. And so the years can go by in that land purchase, even if on the, uh, after the first year, it doesn't look that great. I mean, you, the, the 10 years from now, depending on what inflation does and everything else, uh, it may actually look pretty reasonable and uh, somebody's in good shape. Whereas it comes to cash rents, we got to cash flow that decision every single year. And with what production costs have done this spring and uh, the end of last uh, winter, you know, folks are looking at those high fertilizer prices, those high cost of equipment, the high diesel costs, everything else. Landlords are well aware of it and rental rates are a lot uh, more reluctant to move upwards because of uh, a lot of what we're dealing with there in uh, production costs. So that's really what I wanted to cover. And again, if you want a more in-depth analysis or uh, write up on it, um, cropland values, uh, the news release was out yesterday. Uh, the other thing is uh, on next month's newsletter, I'm going to dive a lot more in depth uh, into what we're uh, what the land value numbers are actually telling us or what what we've seen and maybe some more uh, speculation and forecasting as far as that goes. So if you have anything for Brian right now, please feel free to type it into either the chat or the Q&A function on the bottom. We'll give it just a minute or two to sure. allow people a chance to, to type things in. And, and I'll just do some after commentary on it. You know, I, this is kind of what I expected to see, to be, to be honest, that there would be a, a, a significant movement upwards in based on what I'd been hearing and what I'd been seeing in other areas that had gotten their surveys done, that we would see a, a significant movement in land prices, that they would go up for the first time in a while. And I would argue that they've actually been going down because they've been trending sideways for the last seven years pretty much zero movement. And if you adjust for inflation in real dollar terms, land values effectively had been going down. Because if you hold even and you have any inflation, then they're going down. So this is really the first real increase uh, since I've been doing the surveys. Uh, and then as far as rents goes, I'm, I'm not surprised that we saw the pop in land values and then not, real, not really any movement much at all in uh, rental rates. That's kind of what I thought would happen because of the scenario that we found ourselves in with high production costs, despite strong corn prices, despite strong wheat prices, despite strong soybean prices. It's a bitter pill to swallow to, to if, if you're a tenant to say, well, yeah, let's, let's increase rent 10%, but I'm also paying, paying a thousand bucks a ton for fertilizer. And I'm on an 18 month wait list for a new piece of machinery and uh, diesel prices are five bucks. So Again, and Frain and I have had this conversations many uh, many times that a, a land purchase is an investment decision, a, a a cash rental contract is a cash flow decision, and they can be very different uh, outcomes that you reach because in one year, yeah, the land purchase maybe didn't help you and you went backwards, but you can make that up in the future. You can't on a cash rental negotiation. All right. So we did. We did have one question come in. Any thoughts on the recent purchase? Uh, recent prices of twelve thousand five hundred dollars per acre up north, or three thousand nine thousand three hundred dollars plus in the southwest in Cast of Castleton. Um, investors or farmers buying uh, at these high prices? I am not familiar with those transactions that's, that that uh, that you're speaking of. There, uh, nobody's brought them to my attention. If I had to guess at those prices, I hate to, that probably strikes me as, as an investor making that purchase and not a, uh, a, 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 a farmer in the region. Um, unless the, the, only, the only thing that would make me believe that that's a farmer buying it is if there is some special circumstance as to why that uh, uh, person paid that. For instance, in, in Iowa, you might have a hog production facility 
way overpay in terms of market prices for a parcel right next to that hog confinement facility because they need a place to dump their manure. And even though they know they're paying more than, than what they should, uh, they go ahead and pay it anyway because it's close and they're really not buying it to necessarily produce and make a lot of money raising corns and beans. They just need a place to dump their manure and, at any cost. They don't want to haul it all the way across the state or something like that. So, and, and I have a, an anecdote of our own family's farm where we overpaid for some pasture land because it was right in between two section pastures we already owned. We'd been renting it 30 years. The family decided to sell it. We overpaid by a hundred bucks an acre because it was worth more to us in our operation than it was anybody else. It's a kind of a utility thing that we we would we would get more value out of it so we could pay more. The only other answer for this, so as a farmer purchase, purchasing it, that could be the reason. The only other thing is it probably, it could be an investor as well, uh, who's just looking for a place to store some money as a hedge against inflation and diversification of, a, of some kind of a portfolio. So but Brian, probably, yes. Brian, there was some comments in the chat um, that the that they were both farmer purchases. So they were both the farmer one, purchases. Yep, yeah. It was a farmer in Castleton, and in another comment, both farmer purchasing were very large farmers. Yeah, I could see it. I mean, and and if they have the if they have the funds, and and here's the other thing coming out of 2021, and I'm I'm going to be publishing the uh, FBM stuff uh, um, shortly on the state averages. A lot of farmers made solid money in 2021. I mean, the best in in almost a decade. So there are some producers out there that are very flush with cash right now. And so it very well could have been farmer purchased by, by some of those individuals. All I can say, though, is that the averages are telling me that those prices are right now anomalies and not the, the, the norm for what decent productivity index ground is selling for and we've got we've got examples like that that you hear about from from places like indiana and iowa where you hear about twenty two thousand dollars an acre or twenty thousand dollars an acre that's still it's still well above the average so that, i guess that's my only comment with it unless unless i could speak to the individuals uh and find out i i can't it's hard to say so there was another comment just and then we'll try and move on uh the castleton land was very high quality 92 productivity index. So it sounds like there's mm -hmm. some pretty good, pretty good ground. Mm -hmm. All right. So for the sake of time and to make sure that we get a, get a chance for everybody to participate, um, I will move on, I guess, into my section. So make sure we get through everything. All right. Um, Thank you, everyone. All right. Thanks. All right. So um, assuming that everybody can see my material, I will start moving on. So my name is Frayn Olson. I'm the crop economist and marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Um, here's my contact information. If you do have some questions, uh, you know, feel free to reach out and, and I'll do my best to try and answer them. So I'm going to try and give a quick, quick review and update on not only the April USDA WASDU report, which came out last Friday, but also make a couple comments on the prospective plantings report we got at the end of March, uh, and then end on a few comments about what's happening currently in Russia and Ukraine. So uh, just to give everybody some, again, reference points, um, this is a table I've showed before. Um, this shows the uh, pre-report industry estimates. So there's usually a survey taken of private analysts and forecasters on what they expect the numbers uh, for USDA to be published during the WASDU report. So the, the blue line on top shows the average trade estimate. There's about 25 to 28 analysts that go into this pool. Um, what they're looking at is what, what is their best estimate or forecast for the projected ending stocks? How much grain are we going to have left in the bin just before harvest? So these are for the old crop numbers. This is for the crop that's currently in the bin. And again, this would be for the full marketing year. So the blue line on top would be the average trade estimate. This is what the trade was expecting to see. And then on the very bottom, in, highlighted in red, is the actual number that we got. Um, so when we look at ending stocks for all wheat, corn, and soybeans, again, the numbers came in very, very close to what the trade was expecting. Again, the, typically this April report doesn't have a lot of shock value in it. Um, you know, again, we were looking for potentially some adjustments because of the war between Ukraine and Russia. 
Um, I do think USDA will, will con in, continue to include and incorporate some of that information, but they're not going to do it uh, all in one report. They're going to they're be a bit cautious in trying to make adjustments or reporting. Now, on a, also on a comment uh, about the May report. So um, in the first part of May, we're going to have another update for the WASDE, the World Agricultural Supply Demand Estimates. The May report is going to be more significant because the May report is the first month that USDA starts making formal projections in the WASD for the new crop, the 2022-23 marketing year. So that will be uh, that will be watched very closely, and again, we'll have some more information and updates as they become available. So just keep your eyes and ears open for the May report because that will be a market mover more than likely because of of some of the information contained in it. So this is the old crop numbers. Uh, we also did get an update on the projected production coming out of South America. Um, so once again, the blue row on very top, which is the average trade estimate, is what the private analysts were expecting to see out of the report. If you look drop down to the very bottom, highlighted in red would be the numbers that we actually received. And once again, if you start comparing uh, for both Argentina and Brazil, you look at both corn and soybean production, uh, the private estimates came in very, very close to what the USDA was, was actually forecasting. So again, not a lot of shock value involved in this. Uh, we are starting to zero in on some of the numbers for, in particular for Brazil, but also for Argentina. Um, soybean harvest in Brazil is pretty much completed. Uh, the corn harvest is basically completed, completed for the first crop corn. Second crop corn, which is the safrina crop, is being planted right now. So the, corn, the forecast for total corn production that USDA puts out is for both crops. So it'd be for both the first crop and the second crop because it's within the marketing year uh, that USDA uses for, for US corn. On the Argentine side, again, corn, corn and soybean harvest in Argentina is almost complete, uh, but we'd still, they still do have some acres to clean up. So again, our estimates, the forecast for total bushels produced, or in this case, metric tons produced, is, is starting to, to um, zero one on some, some pretty common numbers. So again, not a tremendous amount of shock value. Uh, we've known kind of a, had a pretty good inkling that these numbers were coming out, uh, not any ma major surprises. Shifting gears a little bit, I do wanna talk about the perspective plantings report, kind of the same general format, um, the uh, Bloomberg or Reuters and Bloomberg, as well as, as Dow Jones usually do surveys of the analysts. Um, on what they expect to see. So the blue lines on the very top was what the traders were expecting to see for planted acreage in the March 31 planting intent or planting perspectives report. Um, so as you look across um, relative to what we had actually planted in 2021 last year, um, we were expecting to see a decrease in corn plantings and an increase in soybean plantings, which we did get. But that shift, that swing was a little bit bigger than what we had expected. So there was a, a, a more of a reduction in corn acres, uh, more of an increase in soybean acres than we expected. Thus, the reason we saw some of the pr uh, big price movements, especially in corn after the report. Um, now, one of the comments I want to make for not only corn, soybeans, but also when we look at the spring wheat number, as well as the Durham number, um, the 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 survey for the prospective plantings report was taken in about the first two weeks of March. So we were aware of Russia invading uh, Ukraine and the war starting, but we, it hadn't been going on long enough for the market to really figure out what the potential implications of that invasion and how long this war may last. And so obviously we're learning more every day about the, the situation and about the kind of the ripple effects or the implications, not only for agriculture, but for energy. So I do expect as we move through, but we get another uh, survey-based report in June. So the June uh, uh, plantings report, we'll get an update on what these acres, acres were. I do expect to see, I guess my opinion, probably a little bit more of a rebalancing between corn and soybeans. I think the market is trying to signal farmers to say, don't switch quite as many acres into corn as we had originally expected. Um, the other question then is what about spring wheat? Given now some snowfall and some moisture, especially in central Western North Dakota, as well as much higher spring wheat prices, are we gonna see some small adjustments or shifting in North Dakota to try and bring back some of those spring wheat acres into production? 
Again, we're going to have to wait to see. I do expect to see a little bit of a rebalancing. So shifting gears, I just want to give you kind of an update, a current update on some of the core issues in particular with uh, Ukraine and the Russia war. Um, I'm going to talk about Ukraine first and then shift over some issues on, on, on Russia. One of the things I think we need to start really thinking about, previously we've always thought about Black Sea, like Black Sea wheat, Black Sea corn, Black Sea barley or feed barley. We, we've lumped Ukraine and Russia together because they are so common. They, they got very similar production practices. Uh, their cost of productions are, are, are a little bit different, but somewhat similar. Obviously, they're shipping, um, loading vessels into the Black Sea at ports. They're literally within a few hundred miles of each other. So historically, we have thought about Ukraine and Russia kind of as, a, as, as, a, as twins. But now, because of the war, those two are very separating pretty dramatically. So the conditions uh, going on in Ukraine are obviously very different than the conditions going on in Russia. And I think as we move forward, not only from a pricing standpoint, but also from a shipping and logistics standpoint, we are now going to have to think about Ukrainian wheat and Russian wheat as two separate uh, types of wheat. Now, the class of wheat, the quality of the wheat is going to be very, very similar. But when we look at pricing and accessibility and the ability to be able to deliver the product on time, we're going to think about Russia and Ukraine as two different kinds of markets. So let's review very quickly some of the most current information that I have anyway on what's happening in Ukraine. When we look at old crop grain shipments, again, the crop that was harvested last year for both corn, uh, malt, or feed barley, excuse me, as well as wheat. Um, so Ukrainian shipments have obviously slowed. Early on in the war, some grain had been diverted into Moldova and Romania to be loaded onto ocean vessels. So these were purchases that had already been committed and, and you, the Ukrainian companies were trying to deliver on those purchases. Uh, there is still a little bit of that happening, but most of the current shipments of grain, some of the newer purchases and the ability for Ukraine to be able to ship product out of, uh, out of the country, the, the primary focus has really been shifting now to the rail system. And in particular, moving some grain products into Western Europe. Now, one of the big challenges, I think I mentioned this, this before, is that the rail gauges, the width of the railroads, the rails um, in, in the former Soviet Union countries is wider than the, than the gauge of the rails in the rest of Western Europe. And again, that was done primarily as a, as a uh, military and a safety pr uh, uh, precaution to prevent any kind of uh, major troop movements by rail. Um, so they purposely made the gauges different. But now as, as Ukraine struggles with how do we get product by rail across the country and then into the Western Europe, they're looking at, at being forced to basically transload. So the, um, the Ukrainian grain hits the end of the rails. They have to be offloaded and then loaded onto a different rail car or different uh, train system to be able to move into Western Europe. Now, they are starting to make, make inroads into that, kind of trying to get the product a smooth, movement a lot smoother, but it is being somewhat complicated, okay? And we got to understand that. The other issue that I've read a little bit about is that rail cars, those cars suited for a moving grain over large distances, um, they, they have grain rail cars available. It's just, again, making sure that they're in the right place at the right time understanding that again, troop movements and military movements take priority on the railroads. For new crop, there's been a lot of discussion about how many acres and uh, uh, are actually gonna get planted in Ukraine this year. And then what does that translate into production and yield potential? Again, given the fact that it's getting very difficult to get the fertilizer and the chemical and the fuel that's needed to be able to put a crop in as well as maintain the crop quality. Um, right now, the current estimates are anywhere from a 30% to a 60% cut in production, reduction in production. Um, and, and those numbers do vary a little bit by crop, specifically by crop, uh, again, somewhat depending upon the region that the crops are growing in. So we don't have a really good read yet on what the potential reduction is going to be by crop specifically, but we do have this pretty wide range where there's a recognition we're going to have lower production coming out of Ukraine. They're going to continue to have some shipping problems because of the ongoing war, uh, but how large will those be and, and, and will there be able to, to make some workarounds? Shifting to Russia very quickly, um, old crop grain movements, again, this is, would be crop that was harvested previously. Uh, they are being slow. 
uh, they're slowed down, but they are still being able to meet the requirements. So if there's been grain sales previously and there's contracts in place, the Russians are, again are trying very hard to be able to fulfill those commitments. Um, one of the things that is complicating things in particular for Russia, now most of the major ports for Ukraine uh, for loading ocean vessels, uh, again, loaded in the Black Sea and then eventually transported into the uh, Mediterranean and, and off to its final destination. Um, most of the major loading ports in Ukraine have been closed. Uh, the, the Ukrainian government closed their loading facilities when the war began and they haven't reopened. So either they're rerouting it into, into other countries or actually trying to move it by rail. However, for Russia, their major Russian, Russian um, loading port, ports are still open. Um, they are still active. One of the, there was a recent report actually out yesterday talking about ocean shipping rates, in particular for Black, Black Sea vessels. And what's happening is the insurance underwriters for these ocean vessels. So if I'm an ocean company, I own uh, not only bulk shipments for, for whole, carrying grain, or if I have some kind of, of, of um, a, a tanker uh, vessel for, for, in particular for crude oil, or maybe for, for liquefied natural gas, um, you know, those insurance, those companies take out insurance on their vessels. Well, the insurance rates for ocean vessels transiting the Black Sea have gone up significantly. The example that was used in the, in this particular article was that the cost for a 1 million barrel uh, oil tanker. So this would be a standard size oil tanker loaded in one of the major ports in Russia and then transported it to Italy and, and unloaded. The cost just for the freight, the ocean freight, is currently about $3.5 million. That versus about $700,000 before the war began. So obviously there's a huge risk premium. That's not necessarily an area that I would want to be the captain of a vessel going through a military zone. My point in bringing this up is that the cost for ocean freight, at least for this particular region, has gone up fivefold. So this is one of the things I think Russia will continue to struggle with, not only for their, for their petroleum products, but also for their bulk grain products. So even though Russia is able to make some additional sales, they're still trying to push some of their product into the global marketplace. There are countries that are interested in buying it. I do think some of these ocean freight rates and the fact that you're going through a war zone to be able to get your product delivered is going to put a, a pretty major crimp in the system for a lot of the Russian grain movement. So surprisingly, I guess maybe not so surprisingly, given the higher uh, grain prices, there have been new Russian grain sales. There are certain countries, Egypt has been one of those that's come in and actually made some new purchases of wheat from Russia. Again, that relationship between Russia and, and Egypt has been relatively strong over the last several years. Uh, Egypt relies very, very heavily on Russian grain movements, especially for wheat, to try and, and make sure that they have the wheat supplies they need in the country. So there have been some new sales, but again, very, very slow sales pace. And again, they have to be at a very, very low price to be able to mate, meet and match um, the demand base. So again, global wheat prices in particular have gone up pretty significantly, but Russian wheat has actually stayed uh, relatively low compared to the other prices. Now, a lot of buyers that are looking for the, some lower priced wheats that are very, very price sensitive buyers have been going into the European Union to try and backfill some of their supplies. Um, right now, most of the sales have been for French wheat, uh, which has some similar milling and baking characteristics to the hard red winter wheat coming out of Ukraine and Russia. So again, part of it's a pricing thing, part of it's a logistics piece, but also part of it is a quality. Um, the quality of French wheat is actually more similar to probably a soft red winter wheat in the United States versus a hard red winter wheat, but it can still make an acceptable bread product. So We've seen an increase in French wheat sales, at least most recently. Uh, I would say really European sales because uh, France, uh, Germany, and the UK are the three biggest larger, three, three largest exporters of wheat with France being the largest. So people are rerouting, trying to find some alternative supplies, so some alternative supply chains. The challenge we have coming out of the European Union is they don't have the volumes necessary to be able to fully refill or backfill all of the sales coming out of the Black Sea. So we're still short globally on, on typical or normal wheat supplies in particular, but also corn supplies, as well as feed barley supplies, supplies because the French 
uh, do sell a lot of feed barley. One, my, my last comment, then I'll hand it over to Tim. Um, India is now also emerges, emerging as a wheat exporter. Um, depending upon the year and the time period, uh, India produces a lot of wheat. They don't, don't always have enough for export. Uh, but because of a record large uh, wheat crop in 2021, the last year's numbers, um, as well as some pretty large government owned stocks, they are now starting to sell more volumes into the global market. Uh, so some of the, the buyers that are very price sensitive are turning to India as an alternative wheat supply. But again, volumes are relatively small compared to the volumes that would normally be shipped out of the Black Sea. The other thing that, that is, I think, given the Indian government some... Um, I guess, uh, 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 credence or, or ability to be able to, to, to increase some of the export volumes is that there's also expected to be a record wheat production in 2022. So again, uh, India's had a couple of really good years. They have some extra wheat around. With today's wheat prices, they're saying this is an opportunity to try and get some of our wheat reserves lowered. So with that, I will stop sharing. Um, I'll hand my, my mic and everything over to uh, Tim Petrie, and he'll go through some of the information for the livestock sector. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Tim Petrie here. I'm going to talk uh, about uh, uh, several different livestock, and mainly I want to show you what happened compared to last year. Uh, prices are back up to 2015 levels for most livestock, and I know in some cases it doesn't seem like that because uh, costs have went up, but uh, prices are higher. And then also, in some cases, show you the impact of uh, the uh, Russian-Ukraine situation that, uh, and how really the big impact then has been on feed and corn prices and, and how that's affected too. So we'll move along here, start off with uh, Fed steer prices and uh, maybe spend a little bit more time in this chart like I always do showing you the keys because all my slides are color coded the same way. And so uh, just moving along there on the bottom in the middle of the green line, I like to put the last three years on a chart because to give us that perspective and if it's happened in the last three years, it could happen again. So the green line is 2019, the purple 2020. In some cases I do a five-year average. So that's the purple line or else it's 2020. Then the light blue line, or the blue line there is always last year and the red line is this year. If there is a futures market, the uh, since we're using red for 2022, the futures for this year are the red squares. And then if there are futures trading into 2023, that's the orange. In a few cases, and I'll tell you that when we get to it, the orange, I've also used that as the futures before the Ukrainian war. And then uh, to show you uh, uh, that was that would have been the red ones before the war and, and just a, a guide to show you what has happened since then. So start off with Fed steers. Uh, again, we're, you, there's, with the, starting on the left-hand side of the chart there, you see the red line. Uh, we started off significantly higher than the blue line last year to the turn, tune of $30. Uh, prices continue to go up throughout all last year. And so uh, by now we're about $20 higher and we did uh, back off some here recently because of the things that uh, Brian talked about, inflation and, and so on and high costs of things. And so that's kind of caused uh, uh, fed cattle to kind of stall out here. But if you look at those red futures then all across there, uh, we do have that normal seasonal pattern where they do go down into the uh, in the midsummer. And so you see back down to 136 there by, at the June futures. But then we, you know, we keep that $10 higher by midsummer all the way through the end of the year, back up to 150, $10 higher at the end of the year, and then move to there are 2023 futures. So then we add another $10, $12 on them to begin with. And that is simply based on that we've had three straight years of cow herd liquidation. Uh, this is the first year, 2022 is the first year that uh, in the last several that we will ha not have record beef production. And, uh, and even on the competing meat side uh, in 2022 here, we're expecting lower beef, pork, and a lamb production. And so that is uh, favorable fundamentals and supportive to prices and, 
and, and that's what we see there. So on the next slide then, just kind of want to show you, there's been not a lot of impact of the Ukrainian uh, Russian situation on fed cattle, probably a more so on the macroeconomic side that Brian talked about and, and high inflation and, and so on. So in this case, those orange squares are what the uh, futures were trading at on February 15th, right before the war. And then uh, those red squares are yesterday's closes, but I just checked and the market didn't do very much at all. So that would be pretty current. So yeah, since February 15th, we've taken about six bucks off of Fed cattle futures. But if you go then to the end of the year, like I talked about there up there at 150, there, there's been um, really no impact of the inflationary effects or if there was anything from the Ukraine where they're still identical at the end of the year. But here, you know, right now, uh, you know, there's we still have lingering effects of COVID and and um, and uh, high prices for meats and, and gas prices that that Frayne alluded to uh, going up, going up. That's always a negative impact on uh, on the higher uh, proteins because you know a person stops by and fills up with gas, goes into the store to buy something for the evening meal, and they've just spent. Uh, quite a bit more on gas than they were used to. And, and so that funnels into that. But, you know, the, the key bottom line for the Fed steers then is we expect them to go up cyclically for the next several years based on smaller calf crops. And quite frankly, we're going to very likely do another year of liquidation on cows this year, given the weather 60, over 60% 60 of the beef cow herd right now is in an area with drought. And, uh, and so uh, that does not bode well at all for even maintaining the herd. And we've had a high cow slaughter as well. So that all uh, funnels into the future of, of being supportive to prices. Switch now to feeder cattle. And then uh, feeder cattle, of course, uh, one of the big things that are affecting them is uh, corn prices. And Frayne alluded to that. And, uh, you know, they're at the top. I mean, this is the, the black Bars there are May feeder cattle futures and the green line then is just the, the uh, closes on May corn. You know, my old adage that you've heard me say a lot of times, change corn 10 cents a bushel, change feeder cattle a buck in the opposite direction. So again, I go back there to February 15th where that purple um, arrow is there and that's right before the war. And so you see then uh, corn was trading at 637 and a half. And uh, and uh, feeder cattle were up there at 176.95. Uh, feeder cattle were at life of contract highs, and then uh, the war hit and corn went up. And so you see, corn went up quite uh, to, to probably to the war into uh, into March, then and then leveled off. And then, like Frayne said, there you go to the end of March. They're down. To look at the bottom of the chart in April. The planning intentions came out with fewer acres of corn. So then corn uh, spiked again, probably more so because of the planting and tensions in the war. So uh, bottom line is uh, from February fifteenth to yesterday. Corn went up $1.46. And so if you go back to my uh, formula there, that would mean that, that feeder cattle prices uh, should be 15 or should be at $14.60 lower. And so you see then uh, as of yesterday, then uh, feeder cattle were very close to that down $15 went from 176.95 to, to uh, 160. Two or is one sixty one ninety five. There was the was the close yesterday, and very similar to that. So you you know we've got that. Why are feeder cattle prices volatile? That's because corn is volatile, and a lot of factors uh, affecting both. So you know, let's go look at the different market classes there of feeder cattle. Here are five fifty to six weight calves, and again, these are averages, a wide range, still in prices in auction markets, and and uh, none of the auction markets reported by AMS this week even were open because of the uh, of the weather. But this is last week's prices. So you see the 
uh, uh, still uh, much higher there. We were down about 170 on an average last year and, and up to 197 or so, 98 uh, last week. And so uh, uh, quite an increase in calf prices. Again, uh, fewer of them to sell. This is the result now of three smaller calf crops. And uh, so uh, that's very supportive to prices, even though uh, corn prices are high. And, and uh, you know, one thing that's kind of keeping a lid on, uh, on these lighter weight calves right now is the dry conditions. It's dry all the way from Texas right on up through here. They, Texas did get some rain and we did get some snow. So we'll see what happens. But still, uh, you know, the drought monitor that came out this morning showing a dry. But, you know, there, we're still, there's no futures market for calves, but we're still higher than last year, back again to 2015 levels. And we certainly expect that to continue into the fall. Again, October, middle of October is a tough time to sell calves. As you see there in the last three years, it's been the low for the uh, year and, and even the previous year, 2018. So the last four years. And so that's likely to happen again. We'll have that seasonal pattern, but still the bottom line is there are higher uh, prices, you know, and we can forecast that for the rest of the year, unless something drastic happens there and even cyclical higher in the next couple of years. Go to the heavier weight yearling type 800 pound steers that we're selling now. And again, the same key on the chart and kind of the same story there increased throughout last year, but kind of down there into October. Here, I kind of want to show you then how the corn prices and mainly the, the, you know, the Ukraine situation at the beginning here. And then, of course, the planning intentions funneled into that. But, um, you know, right at, at 160 and uh, last year, you know, about still about $10 higher than we were um, last year at this time. But go to the May futures that I just showed you. Again, we've ratcheted them down $15. Our expectation were those orange bar uh, squares up there. That was what we were on February 15th. And, and so uh, at least in the nearby, we've taken 15 uh, bucks off. Uh, however, when we go throughout the year, it does narrow down to about seven and six seven dollars and sixty and change difference just since February 15th in the fall futures. Although they're still up there about uh, 180 compared to they were 150 in them, you know, late October there uh, last year, and then they, they did come back. And then way on the left hand side, that uh, that's that square without filled in, that's what the actually the January and March futures are trading at uh, 180 for uh, uh, next year. So again, kind of the same story there, higher than this year. The one uh, market class that has been helped by uh, by inflation and high gas prices and that are. Uh, call cow prices that seasonally this time of the year, they usually do go up after again, reaching fall lows when we PG check and sell all those cows. And so uh, call cow prices have went up even more so than they usually do on a seasonal basis. And that goes in that hamburger is selling very, very well compared to the higher uh, loin cuts and so on on beef and a big demand for hamburger and and, uh, and and not getting as much in from Australia because they're in, in herd rebuilding. So uh, that funnels into cow prices. And the other thing I just want to mention, my series here is that it was 85 to 90 percent lean cows. And you see in the top in Montana and South Dakota, there isn't uh, cow prices are not reported by USDA in North Dakota. And what these 85 to 90 percent lean cows now they're old cull cow uh, uh, broken mouth cows that have had a calf on them all the previous year and so they tend to be below the market uh, producers sometimes say tim i'm selling cows for more than that and i agree with that i've just on the right hand side then you know i've got a market report from last week and yeah th th this was towards the end of the, the bottom of the range because these are uh, old thinner cows but you know we sold cows last week you see up in the 90s or a lot of a lot of cows selling in the 80s that are uh, fleshier and so on. Maybe we're younger cows with bad bags or the lost a calf or something. But the cow prices then have responded nicely in spite of about 
17% higher beef cow slaughter this year and last year. Again, it's very dry down in the Southern Plains. They're liquidating some cows or at least selling cows earlier than might have went in the fall. So this isn't uh, lower supplies. Actually, we've got uh, stronger supplies. Uh, but it's all uh, demand and and demand for hamburger and 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 the cheaper cuts. <clears throat> Go to the hog side uh, um, again. Here the uh, kind of the same thing I showed you before on. And uh, and uh, hog prices again seasonally usually go up into midsummer and then go down into the fall with the with the bigger runs we have in the fall and the shorter supply of hogs in the summer and the purple line there shows the big impact on COVID and you know only fifty dollar carcass hogs and very tough year and so producers cut back uh, like I said we're reducing reducing. Uh, uh, pork production this year, a really tough year in 2020. And then uh, with that, even that cutback funneled through to quite a bit higher prices last year. And uh, so far have been above last year by a little bit and, and kind of right on the, the, uh, the futures, the red futures are yesterday's closes saying, you know, by midsummer, we'll have $120 hogs and and uh, staying above last year as well. And actually, since two since February 15th, the, the gold ones there, actually we've seen a little bit higher uh, hog prices. So uh, no impact there from the war. And again, pork is a little bit uh, cheaper than beef there. And we're, we're short. Uh, the hogs and pigs report, new hogs and pigs comes out quarterly, just came out at the end of March and was uh, a lower number of hogs than the trade was expecting and been uh, no a buildup of, of sow numbers. The breeding herd and all across the board is down. So uh, lower supplies there, certainly supportive to prices. Go to the lamb side, kind of similar story here. My purple, I know is 2016 to 20 average, but uh, lamb prices struggled in, uh, you know, back in, in, uh, in 2020 in particular, but uh, last year rebounded very nicely as restaurants, particularly white tablecloth restaurants on the East and West Coast and so on came back on board. And, and uh, you know, another thing, uh, lamb was kind of helped by the pandemic as well, because there was lamb at the meat counter when they ran out of other things. So people said, I'll give it a try. And they did and liked it. And so, uh, and we have the strong, uh, ethnic uh, demand as well. So lamb prices have been uh, higher than last year. And, and, uh, and, uh, you know, we expect uh, lamb prices to stay fairly strong. Again, they're going to be impacted by inflation, probably more than the other commodities because they are the highest price protein. But again, particularly the holiday season right now, a good demand for lamb and with the ethnic sector and so on. So uh, good lamb prices there. A feeder lamb prices compared to last year are not quite as high. And that kind of just goes back down to the higher uh, corn prices affecting them as well. So uh, just finish up here. Uh, you're all aware of avian influenza and seen the reports about egg prices and so on. And, and so uh, just on the upper right or upper left hand corner there, show you what's happened to wholesale egg prices in the last month. You know, in the middle of March, the wholesale price of eggs here in, in the Midwest were $1.40 and that's went up double, it's twice as high up to over, over $2.80, almost $3. And so that's funneling you know, over into the retail level as well. And so, you know, and then we have the peak demand of the year right now, right before Easter as well for eggs. And so you see on the bottom, egg prices usually do spark up into April, right at Easter and then fall off. But the dramatic increase this year was due to avian influenza and, and, and impacting uh, the uh, egg layers way more than the broiler industries uh, so far. And, you know, Iowa's the largest is close to us. You get a lot of eggs and Minnesota's big too. And, and the, uh, the central flyway snow geese have been affected and, and so has affected that. So you see uh, those higher egg prices right now, we just 
uh, have to live with them even this Easter and maybe some stores will kind of loss later but you can expect to pay higher. But you know, on the top there, I have bad news that way and egg prices and good news the other way are uh, NDSU Meat Lab, we just had a big research product and project and they did slaughter a lot of lambs up there and had a lot on hand to, to sell. And so they have an Easter special. And so uh, they were selling leg of lamb for $3.99. Again, the lowest price probably for uh, quite a few years on that. So uh, that's the good news, at least for me, I got a leg of lamb, but we also, we're gonna spread it around. Also gonna have ham for Easter. And I have a son-in-law that makes a real mean prime rib. So we're gonna have a lot of variety there. So with that, uh, Happy Easter to everybody and turn it over to Ron and uh, let him talk about some new USDA programs there. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, okay. Another uh, ad hoc farm program to talk about. Uh, we've been kind of waiting for, uh, for USDA to, to get their act together. They said they were going to simplify some things and, and this is based on, uh, on the uh, PL uh, public law 117-43, and it actually targeted 750 million to assist livestock producers. Okay, another, more acronyms to remember. I do have a few slides here with a lot of words on there, but I won't go through everything. I just hit the highlights. You can you can download this if you want to read all the details. But uh, the acronym now we want to uh, learn about is the ELRP, Emergency Livestock Relief Program. Okay. And what this is doing, uh, there could be producers that are already getting this. It's gonna be immediately delivered. Um, LFP was the program that producers got last year during the drought. And they actually just finished the sign up for the 2021 in January 31st of 2022. Last year nationwide, there was 100,000 applications for about $670 million for the LFP program. So this new program, the ELRP, then is it just just takes information from that from last year, and whatever you got last year, you get a payment. And it's also uh, we got we've got it broke into two different phases, and this is called phase one. So last year, if you were eligible for an LFP, you will be eligible for a L L uh, ELRP. And uh, whether you're in a drought county or not, it doesn't matter. Whatever you got last year, you're going to get some money this year. Okay. Every single county was eligible last year for a payment in North Dakota. So if you applied and got a payment, then you will be eligible. Uh, you do not need to submit another application. It's going to quickly be, be pushed out by FSA. And last year, here are the drought payments that were that, that we ended up with after the year was done. Uh, you can see Trail County kind of sneaked in there with five payments. Uh, and then uh, and then the middle of the state was the worst. They'll get bigger payments. They call it monthly payments, but it's basically bigger payments for those counties. And um, to be eligible, you need to have, as I mentioned, you need to have a, a, an LFP from the previous year. 90, uh, you will get 90% of that if you are an underserved producer or beginning farmer producer or a veteran. Um, probably don't, don't have too many of them in North Dakota, but for everybody else, they will get 75% of what they got last year. It's estimated that the USDA will be paying out 577 million for this program right now. Uh, as you remember, um, these are the in, uh, based on the drought monitor. These are the are the are the triggers that trigger the payments for the LFP program, and, and I'll get to more of that in a little bit. This is just for your own information if you wanted to download that. Um, the current stats um, as of April fourth uh, from last year, there was eleven thousand applications of LFP pay, paying out eighty two million for the state. Now, just tomorrow now, April 15th, the new grazing season will start. So the new 2022 LFP program will, will start. Right now, the current drought monitor, there's five counties that have hit D3, Billings, Divide, Golden Valley, McKenzie, and Williams. And uh, if you hit D3 uh, at any point in time, you are, are automatically going to uh, qualify for free payments. Um, so tomorrow, 
people could actually apply for those three payments, three mo monthly payments. There is a phase two for this program. We really don't know what it's about yet. It, they're just gonna kind of get more information, see how if the, the drought develops and kind of go from there, kind of a flexible fluid plan. There also is, uh, we've been getting a lot of calls on this. When, when is this uh, uh, assistance for crop producers gonna come out? And we still really don't know, but what we did find out was that it's gonna be two phases again. Uh, the first phase will likely be attached to crop insurance. Uh, we don't know if it's gonna be, whether it's based on the crop insurance proceeds you got, you have gotten, but if you had crop insurance or NAP, you probably will, uh, they're probably gonna push out some initial payments fairly quick. And as before, the phase two will be kind of based on conditions that develop. Um, there is, I wanted to mention another program called ELAP for uh, livestock producers. And this is for people that, uh, that they will get benefits based on their eligible losses last year uh, for, haul, for feed hauling compensation. And it will not, it will not be, uh, it, it will not, uh, not only be retroactive for last year, but it will be in effect for this, this year and subsequent years. So with that information, I just thought I would share that with you. Um, the USDA just announced this lately and uh, any more information are found, uh, can be found at uh, farmers.gov, usda.gov. And you can also contact your local FSA for more information. So thank you. All right, thank you, Ron. So I know we've run just a few minutes over here, but um, I wanted to make sure, are there any questions uh, that you might have? Please feel free to use the, the chat function or the Q&A, uh, type those in and we'll try and get to them as soon as possible. Um, again, I'll give just a minute or two here for people to be able to type that in. Um, again, I just wanna one more time to thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, we do have these uh, webinars once a month. It's usually the, the first Thursday after the WASDE report. So we try and provide some information and update and analysis of what happens within the supply demand estimates from from USDA. So be looking for a notification on that. Um, and we also like to, uh, again, thank you for coming. Um, there's also a monthly newsletter that we've been trying to put out. Uh, again, if you've registered for this webinar series, you should be on the listserv or on the list to, to receive that. Um, there's no, no fee or any charge for that, but we do we send it out uh, approximately once a month. Um, so we'll just, again, give one more chance for everybody. Uh, there's a thank you that came across. We appreciate, again, your your participation. So if there's anything, uh, feel free to, to, uh, to type that in now. Um, I know that in, in, again, speaking for all of the other presenters, if you do have additional questions that come up later, uh, you, you all know how, where we live, you all know how to contact us. So don't, don't feel, uh, don't hesitate to contact us and feel free to, to visit with us about any kind of questions. Looks like there is one question that came in. Um, this is for Ron. Um, uh, there's a push for these uh, carbon programs lately due to the current administration focus on climate change. Anything wor worth looking at or to take advantage of? Well, as far as I know, that this is a, a big push from the, the this administration is carbon programs. And of course, we did have that $5 carbon, carbon program. Um, it, for North Dakota, uh, I, I don't know exactly how it's all going to can all, we don't have enough information, but yes, it's something that we will have to keep an eye on and I'm sure there will be programs that deal with it, but all we know right now. And, and I would also add to that, that I, I know Dave Ripplinger is also uh, following the carbon markets um, and some of the private products pretty closely as well. So uh, I, I know that he will have some information as, as this moves forward and we learn more about the different private products as well. So, any other questions? All right, well, hearing none and seeing none, again, thank you for your participation today, and I hope everybody has a great holiday, and, uh, and the, the, the weather improves and we finally get spring. So, thank you very much, everybody. Mm -hmm.